Hey folks, my name is James Hall with Bassmaster Magazine here with John Jones, our friend from Little Cow Ranch Pond and Lake Management here at beautiful Lake Y. And we have a beautiful day to talk about Pond Lake Management. Um, I know this is a series we've been uh, publishing for about three years now. We've done several surveys, um, but there's still a lot of information that, that I'm curious about, John, and that's not so much what to do uh, as much as what not to do. I feel like if I were out here all by myself, uh, I would be making a ton of mistakes. So why don't we talk about the mistakes people make? Absolutely. And and, uh, and what is the, when we're talking mistakes and pond management, trying to create great bass fisheries, what's number one on your list? Lack of consistency. So you want to be consistent with your management practices, whatever they're going to be. You want to think about what your, first off, you want to know what your goals are going to be. And you want to work towards those goals and only those goals. That's that's the whole point of the management plan. But what I see so often is real splotchy management where a person gets excited about it. They get a new property or maybe their kids are old enough to fish and they go really hard for a little bit of time and then they get burnout. They don't see the results they want very, very quickly. And so they move on to the next, the next hobby, whatever that may be. So... The number one issue that we see with management is lack of consistency. You have to remember on a lake like this, we made a call a long time ago, instead of doing it abruptly, to instead improve it over the next 10 years. And so a bass, uh, it's, its average lifespan is probably 10 or 12 years. And so that's the amount of time we're going to spend slowly improving this lake year by year. And I don't think, do you have any management fatigue at this point? Oh, uh, no. Absolutely. I did not. I mean, we picked a rate of improvement early on and we've stuck with it and so there'll be ebbs and flows as far as results but we notice that every year the lake is getting slightly better mm -hmm. and you'll look back 10 years down the road and wow it's not even the same lake so mm -hmm. the the number one mistake is lack of consistency try to be consistent with towards your stated mm -hmm. goals and and spend some time thinking about those goals to begin to begin with because um, you don't want them to flip-flop every two years as most of the work you're going to do for goal A is not going to translate to goal B. Yeah, so getting your mind right around that, that's what it, I think it was the uh, biggest hurdle for me because it's not immediate gratification. There's no such thing Absolutely. as immediate improvement when you're talking about managing your lake. So getting your mindset on the long term I think is important for that consistency. So, uh, so that's number one. Now let's roll on to number two, biggest mistakes made. All right, number two, again, I think it's going to be a toss-up on which one of these happens the most, but I'd say not surveying or, or, or checking your population enough. Um, it's hard to improve if you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so, so often, um, folks will do an electrofishing survey or they'll catch a few fish and they'll make a, a snap judgment about what's happening. Hey, the bass are skinny, or I caught 400 of them in the afternoon, or whatever it is, they'll take one piece of information and then they're gonna run with that for the next two or three years. Well, there's a lot of things that could change. Flood events, um, predators, predatory birds, um, algae blooms, uh, um, vegetation infestation. Otters. <laughs> you know, I just gotta go see that one. Okay. Work <laughs> down here. But, you know, there's a lot of things that's going to change. And so, on average, you want to, if you can, you like to do some sort of a population analysis two to four times a year. And um, so yeah, that may or may not be electrofishing, but you want to keep track of it. If you're not going to be able to do that amount of electrofishing, well, then take really good catch data. And you go out there and you keep track of the weights of the fish and the lengths of the fish, and you do a good job. A good scientist, a biologist, is going to be able to tell you a lot from that. But you can't manage if you don't know what's happening then. You know, none of us have x-ray vision to see what's happening out there. We, we have to have data. Information is power. Oh, you're, mm -hmm. you're not going to get anywhere uh, consistency without good population analysis. Yeah, so we've seen that on Lake Y today. We learned we have a ton of, uh, of non-sport fish, undesirable fish. And, and, and we knew we had some. We didn't know we had that many. So it's, and that's, that information is important for us. You know, today was, it, was, uh, it was interesting in the fact that more than likely, those fish have been here the whole time, maybe not in exact the densities today. I would say after today's survey that the total poundage, the, the number one category of, of total poundage is, is non-game species. 
Now, is that horrible? Not necessarily, but there certainly are management considerations. And we're going to do a few tweaks to the management plan to address that to try to reduce their density loss. And we're going to talk more about that later. So, so information is power is number two. So a lot of surveys. Uh, number three. Number three, I would say um, we don't see this here at Lake Y, or I haven't. When, when I come here, I know it gets worse later in the season. But waiting too long to treat your vegetation mm-hmm. or address your vegetation. Um, you know, this is a, this is a system that the, the fish require air to live. I know they're under the water, but they do require oxygen, right? right. And, um, and so if you wait till your weeds are really, really dense and then you do your treatment, you're going to put them at risk for a fish kill. Mm-hmm. And so you're better off treating the weeds in small amounts early in the year, or using grass carpet, using tilapia, or whatever you're going to do to manage those plants, as opposed to waiting until it's a catastrophe. I like to use really silly analogies, but you know, you probably live in a neighborhood, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. You have a choice. You can mow your grass one time a year. Which I prefer, honestly. <laughs> okay, that's fair. But you know, your, your HOA probably prefer, <laughs> prefers that you mow it frequently even before it gets out of hand. And that's what you do with the plants in your lake is you're gonna want to go ahead and uh, keep them under control. Do not put your fish population at risk by letting it cover 50, 70, 80% of the lake and go, oh, let me treat it now. And you're, that's usually the part of the year where the, the water holds the least amount of oxygen and you're you're putting undue risk to your system by waiting that long. All right, control the grass, control the grass. Uh, all right, so after that, number four, we only have two left. I know there's a lot of opportunity for mistakes, but we have two more that I'd love for you to identify. What's the best? We could certainly do the top couple dozen, probably. Uh-huh. Um, Let me think here. I would say it's a tendency of folks to pick the sexy option when managing the fish. And so instead of doing the boring management things that need to be done, they skip right down the list of chores and pick stock Florida bass, okay, <laughs> or buy minnows to feed my fish. When in reality, you really want to look at what your big overreaching problems are and try to fix those. So it's again, great management, great bass lakes. The management on them is very, very, very boring. It's the same thing over and over, repetitive, just like a weight room or anything else repetitive motions here are what produce you know great results and so don't skip over the boring water quality manipulation don't skip over making sure that you harvest enough fish don't skip over the weed management don't skip over those things and just go for buying shad and and bass because there are no shortcuts to great fish that's not the way it works all right be boring I, th- that i can handle <laughs> i doubt that i, I, I got that box checked yeah i don't know so, all right and you get one more one more from your long list of mistakes we all make so make it make it a dandy make it a dandy yeah well we're sitting here by a feeder so i'm going to talk about using a low quality feed yes and so Look, you know, inflation is what inflation is, and and fish food is what it is. And you, you look at a, a quality of uh, or a bag of quality fish food today, that might cost you fifty, sixty dollars. Okay, you might be tempted by swinging by your local farm store and getting a bag of twenty or thirty dollar fish food and think that you're doing the same thing. You are not. It's that simple. Um, if it was that simple, fish farms would use low quality fish food and they do not. There's a reason they use expensive feed is because you want good feed conversion ratios. Okay. And so I'm going to, I'm going to be a little liberal with my math here and just say that a bag, a 50 pound bag of quality fish food is going to grow 25 pounds of baked fish. Right. Okay. Okay. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a, that's all. Think about what that would cost off of the fish truck. Right. Okay. 20, 30 times the the cost of that bag of fish food a same bag 50 pound bag of a omnivore diet or a catfish diet might grow two pounds of bait fish Mm. so while you might save 10 or 20 or 30 percent per bag on the cost of the feed you're actually spending many times over the same amount of money to to grow your fish fish. and so you never save money by by growing or by feeding a low quality feed. It just doesn't happen. So I took a liberty, I'm not gonna show the bag over there. Was you have high quality feed here and low quality feed. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, let's go see. And this is a some sort of a, a game diet or advertised to be such. And you know the protein is thirty six percent. You know, so thirty six percent of of the of the of the cheap stuff uh-huh. is is protein. In the yeah, diet. look, there, there's there's feed that's worse than this. It's twenty eight percent. Again, you don't feed a racehorse mule feed, and you don't feed sport fish. A, a feed made for tilapia and and catfish. Those fish can survive on that diet. A bluegill is not that sort of fish. It means a higher protein diet. You know, this thing's got a fat of you know three or four percent here. That sounds pretty low. It is pretty low. That's about a third or a quarter of what I want to see on the fat ratio. You got to know that not all proteins and fat sources are the same. Okay. Their digestibility is different. And so I could go on and on about what I don't love about this feed right here. But just suffice it to say that in today, in 2024, if the bag of fish food is costing you 50 or $60, you're most likely getting the right type of okay. fish food. If you're getting it and it's 20 or $30, that's not something you want to feed to your sport fish. That's fine for a catfish lake. Okay. That is not fine for what you're trying to do. So how I always select the amount of feed I'm going to feed in a private lake is I pick a budget. You pick the budget of, uh, that you want to spend on fish food here. It doesn't matter what that is. Uh, you have a max feed rate of five pounds an acre a day. On a large lake like this, you're not going to usually feed that much. You're going to be down from that, from that rate. But you pick a budget, and then you divide that by the number of bags that that budget will, um, will buy, and that's what your feed rate is. And you try to split that throughout the growing months of the year. And so again, try not to be blotchy about that. We don't want to be feeding really well and get a bunch of fish dependent on feed and then pull it off because, you know, we got lazy or ran out of the dough or whatever the case is. If you're going to feed those fish, make sure that you service your fish feeder. That's another thing is they'll come by with there's still feed in it. Well, you know, push the test button. Make sure it's actually feeding. <laughs> yeah. Rule of thumb is I try to see a feeder emptied once a month. I think that's it. That's as generally in a max feed rate that's going to be one feeder per two acres of water okay and you're going to feed in the southern united states probably intensively seven to eight months a year okay. so now that we're on on the topic of food i know it's a big deal um i, I it, we were talking earlier and i was like well when well, you talk about the five mistakes what's the one thing that you can do if you're gonna if you're if you're gonna you can only have one management practice and you mentioned that it would be Picking great fish food. Yeah, I'd say it, that's it. You know, on, on a small, medium body of water, the the best bang for buck is fertilizer. That we've been over that in the past. Fertilizer is a great bang for buck. It's also very risky. You know, and um, if you don't know what you're doing, you can certainly have a calamity at no time flat, and it's generally not stoppable. So, I'd say the number one thing that you can do is feed your bait fish. There's no cheaper way to grow them. Uh, you have a lot of control over the inputs. You can actually measure the population by watching your feeder go off. You can see if you have problems, your fish not showing up in the feeder. There's so many great reasons to, to feed your lake. If, uh, I gave a presentation yesterday, and I'd say on a, one of the points of it was that on average, a lake may have, a let's call it 100 pounds of, of fish per acre. Okay, I'm just going to big at I'm sure. A broad brush here, but you know, a fed lake can easily be at a thousand pounds of fish per acre without problems. So you think about that's 10x the pounds of fish in a lake, not all catchable fish, mind you, but pounds of fish in the lake by doing one thing, which is feeding regularly. Feed a high quality feed, feed it regularly, uh, and um, wash your fish grow. It's that simple. So, you, you, and you went over the stats for what a bad food looks like. I know that um, that we use y'all's food here. Which uh, can you explain what uh, the viewers should be looking for in a good food? How much protein? How much fat? I'd like to see between forty-five and fifty percent protein on okay. the feed. Um, if you get any higher than that, you're going to have some digestibility issues, um, especially in your warmer climates. Um, the fat, I'm somewhere between nine and fourteen percent oh, wow. is where we want to be, and you want. You want a lot of that to be made up, I like to say, ground up dead fish, you know, and so menade and fish meal, stuff that fish eat in the wild just in a pelleted form. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to see, uh, again, in the scheme of things, fish feed is cheap. It's it's boring. It's not fun to buy. It goes in there. It disappears. Sometimes maybe it feels like 
light money on fire, but it makes more difference than anything else. And so, you know, try to get that 45 to 50% protein, try to get a smaller pellet size. I don't think you need multi pellet size, although I'm not anti it per se, uh, but a smaller pellet size and make sure you have something 10% or better on fat and you're gonna be where you need to be. Uh, if you don't wanna do more than five pounds an acre a day without really watching your water quality, when you're putting in that much goodies, um, you're going to affect your water quality up to a point that's good. After that, it's bad. Commercial fish farms, some of the species are growing 25,000 pounds of fish per acre. Okay, that's a lot. There's a reason that they have people checking the dissolved oxygen and other water quality parameters multiple times every night. Fishing is, you don't want to do that in your private lake. <laughs> that sounds lake. like work. It is. Well, the biggest issue is if you want to grow big fish, you want to have no calamities for 10 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. And so if you're on the cusp of a fish kill, you may be growing fish wonderfully, but if you're living on the edge for 12 years, you're going to have a mistake. So we want to back away from the edge. We don't want to get you into that sort of place unless you have a, a program that monitors and alerts you when it's starting to get dangerous. Because it's really hard to undo uh, once it gets to a spot your fish are in danger. All right, man, that's great. Great information. Great information. So we know we know five things not to do. We know uh, at least one really good thing to do. Uh, we're going to keep pushing that type of um, um, program here on Lake Y and see how she ends up in the next seven years. Uh, but in the meantime, join us again. Come back to this page. Uh, we'll be uploading more videos with more information uh, that's very valuable to help you guys make your fishing paradise better. Thanks for having us.